And that would make me rather happy because it would mean that we wouldn't have to worry about unfriendly AI with that property. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that we don't get to a singularity if we define the singularity in other ways. If we define the singularity simply in terms of the of technology advancing so rapidly that we cannot constructively predict where it's going to go, then we're in a somewhat more modest scenario in which we could have human beings actually participating in an, an, an absolutely intrinsic and indispensable way in the process of advancement of technology such that we do intrinsically retain control over the rate at which it advances but yet because there's so many people involved in contributing to those advances any single individual will constantly be surprised by what they discover has suddenly come into existence the following day and I think it would be reasonable to describe that as the singularity too. I understand. Um, let's go back to your own personal work in life extension technologies. And let me ask you, have your ideas evolved in any way ever since you became gerontologist? Or what was the most surprising thing that you discovered since you became one? Well, I'd be pretty lucky in that respect, actually. I came into gerontology having no real preconception about how we might go about combating aging. And I spent perhaps five years at the beginning of my gerontology career really just learning stuff. And of course, I was publishing stuff during that period. I was um, coming up with new explanations for existing data and so on. But the basic concept underlying sense, in other words, the idea that it might be easier to actually rejuvenate people to repair the molecular and cellular damage of aging, rather than to slow down the creation of that damage by, if you like, cleaning up metabolism. That basic concept has survived intact. I, it was something that I realized in the summer of 2000, 10 years ago now. And it has certainly gone from strength to strength in that time as the idea of exactly how one might go about repairing particular aspects of age-related damage have been increasingly fleshed out and increasingly inspected by other scientists and, of course, worked on by scientists. So I haven't really gone through any um, transition where I had a fundamental surprise. Um, there are, of course, plenty of much more minor surprises that come out during the progress of biotechnology all the time. And my, the things that surprise me are not really very different than the things that surprise most biologists. For example, it was an extremely nice surprise when we discovered that we could take adult cells and de-differentiate them back into an embryonic stem cell state just by exposing them to four different proteins all at the same time, as I'm sure you know. The Japanese researcher Shinya Yamanaka discovered about four years ago now. Um, but, uh, you know, in, in terms of fundamental surprises, no, that hasn't actually happened. And if there is one thing that our listeners ought to take away from this podcast interview with you today, what would you like it to be? I guess the fundamental thing I want listeners to take away from it is that because I'm, I'm fairly sure that most listeners to a podcast like this will have no difficulty understanding that aging is bad for you and that we would we, we should fix it if we can. I think the main thing I want listeners to take away is that we are really pretty close to really doing this. And furthermore, that we're pretty close, maybe only a few decades away from doing it for people who are already in middle age at the time that the therapies are developed so that people already alive today will actually benefit from this. And the question that is uppermost in my mind and should be uppermost in the minds of all your listeners is the question of when those technologies will be developed, because that determines how many of the people alive today will benefit from them. The fact is that 150,000 people die every day from all causes added together. And out of those 150,000, two-thirds, 100,000, die of aging. In other words, they die of causes that young adults predominantly do not die of. Um, 
in the developed world, the percentage is much higher than two thirds. It's about 90 percent. So this is by an enormous margin, the biggest health problem facing humanity today. I would say that it's the biggest problem facing humanity today. And those of your listeners who like working on hard problems or even who like helping other people to work on hard problems should therefore go away and recognize that and just think what they can do to help. And of course, go to sense.org. Have a look at what we say you can do. Have a look at what we are doing. And if you want to get in touch with us, then you always can. We have obviously contact information on the site. That sounds fantastic. But let me keep you just for another minute and ask you the last question pertaining to what you just said. Namely, where do you think would be the cutoff point for people who are able to take advantage of those um, life extending or anti-aging technologies that you are talking about? At the moment, it's obviously very speculative, like any technology that's more than a couple of years away, what the time frame is really going to be. But I think we have a 50-50 chance of getting to longevity escape velocity within about 25 years from now. And I'm damn certain that by that time, the enthusiasm for all of this concept will be sufficient that when these technologies are uh, become available to anybody they will pretty much at once become available to everybody so that's the sort of number we need to look at and these technologies ought to work for pretty much anyone below the age of 60 probably for people up in the 70s if they um are averagely healthy so that gives you some idea but, of course, I want to emphasize how speculative this is. We could get unlucky with these things. We could find a whole bunch of new obstacles that we haven't thought of yet and we haven't discovered yet. And it could be 100 years before we get to longevity escape velocity. I would say that there's at least a 10% chance of that. Luckily, of course, there are, as we've mentioned today, plenty of other approaches, including artificial intelligence and molecular manufacturing that are also being developed, and maybe they'll get there first in that case. But the sooner we plug away on all of these things, I would say, especially on the biotechnological approach, the sooner we will actually start saving lives this way. On that note, I would like to thank Dr. DeGray once again for his time and wish him good luck in his quest to defeat aging. I know that for myself, I'm not too eager to put an expiration date on my life. Also, thanks to all the listeners of Singularity Podcast, and I hope that you all enjoyed listening to this interview as much as I enjoyed talking to Dr. Aubrey de Grey. This was another Singularity podcast, which is a regular feature of singularityweblog.com, where you can go and listen to the recording or download the interview in full. Thank you. Thank you very much.